discussion on why alarm systems should not exceed perceptual and cognitive capabilities. I'm pleased to say that we have a good turnout again. For those of you who may not know who Max Solutions are, we're the creators of the Process View Alarm Management Suite, which, according to a recent ARC study, is the most popular independent alarm management software used in the European power generation market. We offer software, services and training in all aspects of alarm management and we are based in the UK. My name is James Fox. Having worked for iMac, Matricon and Honeywell in the alarm management arena over the last 20 years, holding roles in technical support, site engineering and training, I'm now the product manager for the Process View Suite. Joining me on this webinar is Levan Dubois, an alarm management and HMI consultant. With almost 40 years of experience in the process industries, Levan is active in alarm management since 1990. He is a voting member of ANSI and ISA 18.2, elected co-chair of Working Group 8 of that committee and qualified instructor for the ISA IC39 course on alarm management. He is also a member of ISA 101 and involved in several technical reports of that standard. With that, I would now like to hand you over to Levan, who will guide us through the main body of this presentation. If you have any questions, you can key them into the interface on your screen or wait until the end where there will be time for questions. OK, over to you, Levan. Thank you, James. So in this webinar, we will talk about why alarm systems should not be exceeding perceptual and cognitive capabilities. In this webinar, we will discuss uh, the importance for designers of alarms and alarm systems to take into account perceptual and cognitive limitations of the human brain, a quick overview on how the human brain works, what are the applicable limitations, how to design an alarm system that takes into account the human being, how to design better quality alarms, and recommended literature and references. It's quite a span, this topic, so we will not cover a number of things like task analysis, situational awareness, attention, stress, all other cognitive biases we will not discuss, uh, risk awareness, skill rule and knowledge-based behavior. All these topics can be discussed in future webinars, so if you want to learn more on one of these subjects, please let uh, us know so that we can uh, schedule a webinar around one of these topics. So, most, if not all, standards and guidelines recommend taking into account the operator and his human capabilities when it comes to alarm management. In a paper as recent as August 2015, researchers demonstrate how cognitive biases are ubiquitous in the process of incidents, crashes, collisions, or disasters. What do the guidelines and standards say? Well, in MUA 191, the first guideline on alarm systems and alarm management from back in 1999, now more than 20 years ago, listed, these, listed four core principles of which the first one is presented here. Usability, alarm systems should be designed to meet user needs and operate within user's capabilities. This means that the information alarm system present should be relevant to the users at the time, indicate clearly what response is required, be presented at a rate that the user can deal with, and be easy to understand. The Norwegian Petroleum Directorate issued a directive on alarm systems and alarm system design back in 2001 called YA710. It explicitly describes some of the human factors and limitations. It reads as follows. The alarm system shall be explicitly designed to take into account of human factors and limitations. The design should ensure that the alarm system remains usable in all process conditions by ensuring that unacceptable demands are not placed on operators by exceeding, exceeding their perceptual and cognitive capabilities. Perceptual factors listed were the limitations on the ability, ability of the human brain to take in information. And the perceptual factor presented is also the rate at which this information was presented. As cognitive factors, they list uh, the call upon long-term memory, cognitive biases and disturbances. 
During this webinar, we will discuss the call upon long-term memory, cognitive biases, but we will not discuss disturbances in the control room because that's an organizational issue. Again, subject perhaps for a future webinar. Also, ISA 18.2 and IEC 626A2, they present um, the operator as part of the alarm system. Um, in the figure five of the standards, uh, it presents three stages of the operator subsystem related to alarms. The operator should detect that there is something wrong. He should become aware of the deviation from the desired condition by an alarm caused by a disturbance. And the design of the alarm and the operator in the f interface facilitate the detection of the deviation. He should diagnose the situation, use his knowledge and skills to interpret the information, determine the corrective action to take in response to the deviation. The alarm response procedures aid the operator's diagnosis. And finally, he should respond to the uh, deviation in a corrective way and monitor if the response uh, de um, corrects the deviation. Note that the detection usually is done by the basic process control system and the enunciation by the alarm subsystem of that basic process control system. Basically, first thing that people, plant owners and managers have taken into account is that they don't want to depend on the vigilance of the operator because nowadays he's usually supervising more than seven process variables or tags. The standard list that uh, the ability to carry out the subsystem sub functions is affected by a number of things, such as the workload imposed by the alarm system on the operator, the operator console ergonomics, the short-term or working memory limitations, fatigue, training, and motivation. So what is this all about? Most of us are engineers, automation specialists, equipment suppliers, not psychologists. Do we need to care about the workload? Yes. So this webinar is an attempt to communicate some of the important human factors related to alarm system design and alarm design in itself and uh, in the presentation of the alarms in particular. Basically, what sits between an alarm and an alarm response? Between an alarm and actions to be performed sits or stands a human being with a human brain, which has some significant constraints. The reason an alarm is enunciated with an audible signal, the horn, is to draw the attention of the operator to the alarm. And the reason the alarm is enunciated with a specific color and a presentation mode such as blinking is to assist the attention of the operator right to where it is needed and required to read the alarm message and start thinking about a response based upon an assessment of what is going on. So basically, the brain of the operator sits between the alarm and the action. In the next slides, we will explain how this works based on the latest insights and findings of psychology and neuroscience. Information is all around us. If it needs awareness, it has to go from the sensory system to the working memory, as presented on the screen in the block diagram. The sensory systems are the eyes, ears, nose, and taste of the operator. Now, the last two are not very often used in a control room, but years ago, when the operator was closer to the process, he could also smell and feel and even sometimes taste the process he was monitoring. Think also of vibrations he could feel or the heat produced by the process or equipment. All of this often not too healthy. And by consequence, the operator was moved into a central safe control room away from the process he was dealing with. Now suppose that all that information that is presented all the time to us by the sensory system would go directly to the long-term memory. The brain would be full after a couple of years, perhaps. In fact, what the brain does is that the information is scanned by the visual and auditory cortex for items which require attention. The items requiring attention from the pre-scan are also evaluated according to some pre-programmed biological rules. These so-called rules are created by nature, genetically available, all by training learned over the lifespan of the brain. In fact, just a few items make it to the short-term memory or working memory where the items can be processed using the available information in the long-term memory. 
the sum of all the gathered information in long-term memory we call skills or knowledge or experience. The result of the processing are actions performed by the executive system of the human being, the hands, the eyes and the feet of the person. The amount of information the sensory system receives is estimated at 14 megabits per second. However, only an estimated amount of 16 bits per second make it to the short-term memory, which at its turn is limited to holding an average of seven information items plus minus two. This is an important perceptual limitation we need to take into account when designing an alarm system human interface. And in order to perform any deliberate action, the information is processed in the brain, but the human brain contains only one processor, the prefrontal cortex. So the human brain can perform only one single task at a time. This is another limitation to take into account. In a previous webinar, I've talked about how multitasking negatively affects the time to execute the tasks and increase uh, of errors made. And then there is the long-term memory. It holds the information it has learned, either from study or from experience. And the way the cortex pulls information from that long-term memory is also influenced by that experience and the cultural background of the person. These influences are called cognitive biases, which we will discuss later in this webinar. Good to know, there are, there's not just one processor in the brain. Nobel Prize winner psychologist Daniel Kahneman and his colleague Amos Tversky have delivered evidence that the human brain is a cooperation between two systems, one being vig vigilant and the other performing the human reasoning and deliberation. The vigilant, biologically evolutionary old system is situated in the amygdala at the center of the brain, very close to the spinal cord. It is quick, instinctive, consumes little or no effort, it's very emotional, it's automatic, and we don't have a sense of voluntary control over it. The other system, the reflecting evolutionary recent system, the extension which distincts humans from animals, is situated in the prefrontal cortex. It is slower, consumes a lot of energy, can make complex decisions, is conscious, is more deliberative and more logical. Both systems work seamlessly together, but we have little or no control on the way these two systems interact. Somehow this is comparable on how within a computer CPU cooperates with the graphics card and the network interfaces and so on. But there is a danger in these two systems. When system one, the old vigilant system, is induced by some important stimulus, sound, image, the system one perceives this as danger. In case of danger, the human, human biological system is incented to fight. Think of uh, an attack by, by animals, or to flight. Think of an attack by major animals such as lions, or to freeze. Think of an attack by bears. So an alarm usually comes with an important stimulus to draw the attention. However, we don't want the operator to perceive this stimulus as danger and panic. He would then try to fight the system or to run away from it or to freeze in a seat. So he needs to be trained to perform the desired uh, actions and appropriate behavior. Can he be trained? Sure. Training is one of the strongest recommendations of the IC and IC standards on alarm management. Just like with car driving, a person can learn the appropriate behavior. The brain was genetically not wired to brake or steer or to accelerate. These reflex responses can be trained for the appropriate situation. Same thing goes for alarms. We don't want the operator to hit the emergency button too often or freeze and wait until the safety function or emergency shutdown system kicks in. You would like him to think before responding to an alarm. And in order to provide him with time to think, alarm design should take into account the time to think and the time to perform the required actions, which was a subject of the previous webinar you can still view on YouTube. Let's take a look on how information is presented to the sensory system 
and is making its way to the memory. Operators should have a, re well, a functional requirement for an operator's job description is that the person can hear and see and that he can operate keyboard and mouse. There are discussions taking place in standard committees on the problem of allowing colorblind or color impaired persons to such operating positions. If you or your company do allow this, this also should be taken into account during the design of the operating console. But that's subject, that's not the subject for this session, that's subject for an HMI session. The operator should be able to easily distinct alarms from other information presented. Therefore, the standards and guidelines recommend using alarm callers which are uniquely used for alarms. For example, if magenta is used as an alarm caller, then magenta should not be used for any other purpose in the HMI. However, I see too often HMIs in control rooms where red was used as the high priority alarm caller, but also for indicating closed valves, stop pumps, or even sprinkler tubes. How information is perceived and inter interpreted, it depends on the way it is presented. So, in the next slides, we will illustrate some of these constraints in information presentation. Back in the 1960s, information was presented on black and white monitors. Maybe you recall the Apollo 13 movie, or if you're old enough, you might remember the TV news on, at the time, which dozens of people staring at a TV screen. Actually, it might be also black figures on a white background, but you are looking at, now you are looking at static values. Imagine if these values would change every 10 seconds and are the, still the figures okay. In this presentation, the sensory uh, system and the filters need to compare the changing process value all the time with the limits presented left and right. Think of what would happen to your mind if not only the process values would be changing, but also the alarm limits and maybe the trip limits. No wonder the person at the Apollo 13 mission missed the value of oxygen changing drastically. So with the venue of color uh, screens and color monitors in the control room, it was a, a way to improve the information presented. The horizontal alignment will help the visual cortex to associate values on the same row, but still tell me which value is close to an alarm. Ah, now we see which uh, value is close to an alarm. So, but for how long is this value increasing and what is its relationship to other values? So the Norwegian uh, directive talks about in, uh, aggregating information. This is one way to aggregate several data values into one single item. By the shape of the icon, most people know this is a temperature indication because the shape looks like a thermometer. It has different areas, an out of range area, an upset area, and a normal operating range. Do we still need to show the actual value? I don't think so. As long as the value is in range, the indication how close it is to the another range, that's fine. So, this is a mock-up. It doesn't follow a certain style guide. <laughs> It's just something I made up uh, for this presentation. 20 values, of the, 20 values of the value table are presented uh, in this new context. Now you can see the relationship between the two temperatures, the current consumed by the pump and its inflow. And even you can remove more text if there is a convention on how to read the diagram from left to right and uh, uh, left is lower and right is higher. Conventions are typically put in an HMI philosophy. And then everything is okay from a first view, be it that one temperature is close to an upset area. So far for the visual aggregation of information. However, this aggregation, putting process values in the context is also of value when the operator has to pull information from his long-term memory, as we will see in some of the next slides. And suppose something would be an alarm, it would be clearly visible. Data becomes valuable information when placed in its context. So now let's talk about this short-term memory constraints. Some people think they can retain a lot in their short-term memory, but psychology and neuroscience have proven for the majority of the population, the average is seven. With a standard deviation of one sigma, one could argue that around 15% of the population can hold perhaps eight items. 
but also that 50% of the population scores says six or less. Limiting the inf important information uh, to about six or seven items on a single monitor is a good practice for human machine interface design. But it goes beyond that. How do you observe this figure? If so, it has made it to your working memory. What can you make of this figure? Information is better presented in chunks than in long series. By putting spaces in it, this figure becomes readable. And by adding a little bit more information, it gets totally different meaning. Representing information differently makes it a lot easier to read and to remember. So how much information do we present to one operator? And how much information is too much? And how much alarms do we present to an operator? And why would we list these long lists? Less is better. Task-oriented HMI are a key to success to improve operator effectiveness. If you want to learn more on how to design a task-oriented display, please read ISA 101 and its TRs, or consult a human factors engineering consultant or an ergonomist. So far for the perceptual limitations. Let's talk about the long-term memory. So how many words are there in a dictionary? I don't know. The human long-term memory has enormous capacity, but that capacity is still limited. An average person knows and uses about 3,000 words in a single language. A highly educated person knows about 30,000, but still uses 30,000 on a day by by day basis. I know of a plant where four operators are monitoring a process with close to 64,000 tags, meaning each operator has a span of control over more than 15,000 tags. Can alarm system designers expect an operator knows all these tags and all the related alarm? I think the answer is obvious. Alarm should be not designed on the assumption that the operator knows every single alarm. Also, the retrieval of information stored in the long-term memory is not an automatic repetitive process, not just like your CPU is retrieving the, the information from your hard disk, which is repetitive and uh, repetitive and every time the same thing. No. Actually, psychologists and have proven that what you remember is actually you remember the last thing you remembered. So what do you remember first? Well, just what has been just stored, um, the things that you call upon many times, the memory of a bad experience, the memory of a good experience. So with respect to alarm systems, the most frequent alarms and what to do are usually well known, just like the words you use every day. The ones that, that do not occur frequently are more difficult to recall. So for alarms, same thing. What tags do you remember first? The ones you work with every day? Sure. The ones you need to recall every day? Of course. The ones that cause a problem? Probably. The ones that never cause a problem? Mm, unlikely. So, how many alarms you remember? And how many procedures to solve an alarm you remember? And how many of these you hope your operator will remember? So let's talk about further information processing. As said, information is processed in the prefrontal cortex, which is a single processor. The information the brain processes also subjective to what they call heuristics. Heuristics are rules of thumb a person learns during training. For example, turning your left indicator on in the car before directing your car to the left. How this actually works is explained the skill, rule, and knowledge-based behavior observed and documented by Professor Rasmussen. As indicated, we are not going to discuss this model in detail here, but some of these heuristics are biased, either by recent experience, by a bad experience, by good experience, and by personal skills. These biases are called cognitive biases. So let's see what happens when an alarm is enunciated. 
when an alarm is enunciated, the brain of the person dealing with the alarm will have a selective attention for that situation only. During the diagnosis of the situation, the brain will look for cues. The cues must be selectively attended, interpreted, and somehow integrated with respect to one another. The cues might also be incomplete, fuzzy or erroneous. They may be associated with some amount of uncertainty. Situational awareness, perceived system status or system situation status depend on this element of the decision process. An operator may use these cues to generate one or more hypotheses, educated guesses, diagnoses or inferences as to what the cues or the combination of cues mean. This is accomplished by retrieving information from long-term memory, which is subject to biases. This process is called assessment. Next, one or more alternative actions are generated by retrieving possibilities for memory. To choose an action, the operator might evaluate information such as possible outcomes of each, each action, the likelihood of each outcome, and the negative or positive factors associated with that outcome. For instance, a possible operator action is to push the emergency sh uh, shutdown button, but if he does this without good cause or reason, his manager and the plan manager will not be very happy. So, cognitive biases. A cognitive bias is a pattern of deviation in judgment that occurs in a particular situation, which may lead to perceptual distortions, inaccurate judgment, illogical interpretation, or irrationality. Some type of, types of bias are adaptive, so you can compare them with heuristics. But heuristics, they lead to more effective actions in a given context. And heuristics enable faster decision when timeliness is more valuable than accuracy. So there's a trade-off. The Human Factors Engineering Handbook describes 15 biases related to this process. We're not going to discuss them all. And Wikipedia lists even more cognitive biases. As said during the introduction, we're not going to discuss them all. The psychologists I consulted in preparation of this webinar have retained the following. Risk perception. Risk perception is a subject, subjective judgment that people make about the severity of risk. And they suffer from risk habituations. Workers tend to underestimate the risk from the task they perform frequently, even if the technical risk remains the same. Think of an electrician working on an ele electrical installation where the current is still on. He's aware of the risk, but he, since he has done this very often, he feels comfortable of doing that. So this cognitive bias is also related to overconfidence. So overconfidence is uh, thinking you can drive the car and be on the telephone at the same time. Operators and engineers should be aware of bias in their risk perceptions. Then there is a confirmation bias. That's the tendency to search for information for cues, hypotheses, that confirm one's pre conceptions. People naturally favor information that confirms their previously existing beliefs or good experiences. It's easier for the brain to retrieve the hypothesis that has worked uh, in the past and apply it, rather than evaluating all available hypotheses. It's also related on what is retrieved from long-term memory, as we have learned in one of the previous slides. And now a very important cognitive bias, loss aversion. The more meaningful the potential loss gets, the more loss averse we tend to be. Incidents like Milford Heaven and Deepwater Horizon are an example of this bias. Keeping an FCC running while a shutdown should have been safer and more appropriate, but more costly, that's Milford Heaven. Starting operating well before all safety measures were taken and tested, Deepwater Horizon. So fear for the loss of a couple of more days with no, no production, a couple of million dollars, was the driver to take the risk, and the incident has cost over 50 billion. The last cognitive bias I'll discuss here is framing. It's that human beings tend to pay more attention and add more confidence to bigger figures, such as the probability to survive a surgery at 80%, rather than thinking of the other 20%. Another example is that managers and engineers tend to avoid admitting a certain cost when replacing obsolete equipment. 
So the picture on the list on, on the left shows the situation described by an operations manager at a chemical plant. When an alarm is enunciated, it can have three causes. Cause A with 80% probability, cause B with 19% probability, and cause C with 1% probability. The operator has to reason about the, the alarm, looking for cues, and he can execute action one, which is a response for cause A. He can, ex a, can execute number two, which is a response for cause B, or he can act, uh, um, execute action three, which is a response for cause C. So, but if he um, performs action one for cause C, the plan explodes. So how do you avoid such situation? So how to design an alarm system that takes into account the human being? First of all, you need to take into account the perceptual limitations. So limiting the use of alarm colors, make the alarm display shorter with bigger fonts and more information oriented. Present the information into digestible chunks. Take into account the short-term memory limitations. Limit the number of alarms enunciated at the same time. The famous one alarm per 10 minutes and one alarm per minute during abnormal situation is, like I've often said, too much. Now, what can you do for these abnormal situations? Well, limit the number of alarms per abnormal situations. If you have four alarms pointing to the same imminent abnormal situation, make one alarm out of these four. Also, present cues in a context. Aggregate the information. Take into account the long-term memory recalls. Provide all the information at the mouse pointer of the operator and train the operator in the most abnormal situations because he will not encounter them on a day-per-day -day basis. Also, make the operator aware of his cognitive biases. EDF in France has implemented the STAR principle. Before the operator starts acting, he has to for every time an alarm is enunciated, he needs to think star, stop. I need to think, I need to, then I'm going to act and then I'm going to review the outcome of my actions. So just to be aware that you're not jumping to conclusions and you're not using these biases uh, to perform an action. But what you can also do is to propose checklists, alarm response procedures and alarm logic as part of the alarm message. And you have to make sure that the alarm documentation is up to date so that uh, the operator can query for the alarm documentation. Uh, a good tool to use in this uh, for this alarm documentation is the Guardian tool of Process View. So, what are the obvious measures? Reduce the number of alarms enunciated during normal operation. And you can also review the webinar on KPIs I gave last year. Provide enough time for the operator to read, understand, review, and act upon the abnormal situation enunciated by the alarm. You can see my webinar on timely alarms for that purpose. You can also start designing a task-oriented HMI. Perhaps you can use ISA 101 for this purpose. And don't forget to include a task-oriented alarm display. So what would be a task-oriented alarm display? This is a mock-up. This is not engineered or reviewed by human factors engineer or an ergonomist. So there's probably room for improvement. It's not following a certain style guide. It's just based, from my perspective, on the task the operator might perform when an alarm occurs. But it's using bigger fonts, less alarm messages in the alarm list, triple-coded alarm indications, um, it's framed into a menu bar left and an overview bar on top, showing what information is available. With buttons in the menu bar and that the operator can select to replace the event list below on, on the screen. So, it contains hyperlinks to devices in Alarm. 
it contains a hyperlink to an historian seeing the trend of the process variable causing this or maybe part of causing this alarm it contains hyperlinks to checks and procedures it contain a hyperlink to show the alarm logic that triggered the alarm on another monitor in the control room it contains a button to alarm documentation if required and there are well it also contains an alert list note that an alert is a message which has no priority and is recommended for something that the operator could configure himself it can contain an event list which can be replaced by a list of suppressed alarms for a given situation or a button to show the shelved alarm uh, for a given situation or a button to show removed alarms all informations uh, interesting for the operator to deal with the situation and to help him avoiding uh, all the biases so what I'd like you to take away from this seminar remember that only a limited amount of information find its way to the working memory only a limited amount of items can be held in that memory there is only one processor to reason with that limited amount of items so if you present two alarms there's already too much the information stored in the long-term memory is constrained to what it has learned and the way the prefrontal cortex queries the long-term memory is based on experience, skills, and cultural backgrounds. The skills can be trained. Reducing the number of alarms enunciated at a time frame is, of course, a good way to limit the information which has to find its way to the short-term or working memory. But just as with the reduced number of alarms, the alarm system does not meet the perceptual and cognitive capabilities and limitations of the operator. So, very often the alarm text is fake, imprecise, or redundant with the tag and type information. For instance, if you list P101 T1 LO, that's the same as the text meshes next to it, temperature too low on that tag. We often see alarm lines in one co alarm color blinking and with not enough appropriate contracts, contrast, or with too much text, or too little text, or too small fonts. There are ways to improve alarm presentation. There are ways to provide all the information required at the most point of the operator. New technology enables this. Less but better in alarm information with bigger fonts and better contrast will avoid errors. And lastly, we need to train the operators not to respond without thinking, the famous instinctive system one responses. We need, as an alarm system designer or an alarm designer, assist the operator with the cues, the assessment of the situations and the actions associated with that, with every particular situation. So don't provide different alarms for the same situation. Limit the alarm floods and make sure all possible all abnormal situations for every alarm are assessed during rationalization. If you want to read more about this subject, here's a list of good books. Um, that you can review. Um, I also uh, want to thank uh, Dr. Javier de la Asuncion and Lynn Reka, both cognitive psychologists, for, for reviewing the information presented and for all the support they have provided. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them now. James, will you open the forum or have you received any questions? Thank you, Ivan. I haven't received any questions so far, uh, but as you say, some very useful information there and we'll now open it up for further questions if there are any. If you do have any, please either raise your hand and I will unmute you or you can key them into the interface and we will answer them. So I'll just take a moment for uh, any questions. Okay, no questions. So all that's left is to thank you all for attending. We'll be in touch with details of our next webinar soon. And in the meantime, we'll get this one uploaded to YouTube. So if you wish to watch it again, you can do so from there. It should be up within the next few days. We'll also have a white paper on this subject soon, which will go into greater detail. And this will be available on our ProcessView website. 
If you have any further questions or wish to get in touch regarding improving your alarm systems, then please do get in touch. And all that's left is to say thank you and goodbye. Thank you all. Thank you.